Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but when it says all the time, that means all the time. That means when you're up on the mountain and when you're down in the valley, God is good all the time. No matter where we're at in life, God is on the same level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to welcome and greet all of our guests here tonight. Let's give them a hand clap of praise. Thank you for being here. to the Lord in prayer. If you have a need in your body, you make your way up front, these ministers, to pray for you. Lord, we come to you tonight, Jesus. Lord, you know every need, every situation, God. I felt led to have Brother Hoyt sing a song, and then he's getting, I've got to put him on the spot, so give him just a second. But I'm so thankful for the presence of God that I feel in this place. And it's, a, it's so good, hallelujah, to, to be in God's place in the house, but it's also good to see Taylor here tonight. Hallelujah. from 
tied up and I got here about 8.20, 8.25 and man, there was 17, 18 people already in here praying and I had a fire created today, throughout the day, people praying tonight. I feel God wants to do something great. I'm going to keep the nursery in here tonight. Hallelujah, I feel led just to keep everybody in here. Let's stand. Luke, the 16th chapter and 24th verse. Hope you got a Bible. My The adapter messed up that connects into the MacBook, and so i got to pick up one so our screen ain't working. But Luke, the 16th chapter and the 24th verse. The Bible said, and he cried, said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. 27th verse. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. Lest they also come into this place of torment. The 30th verse. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went up unto them from the dead, they will repent. I want to preach from this subject. God gave this to me last Thursday, sitting there on the couch. Premonitions of night and ending. Premonitions of night unending. If you would lay your Bibles down, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we love you and we need you in this place. I need your presence. I need your anointing. The ears of the ears need to be anointed, God. God, you know what I prayed in this place all throughout this week. I'm asking for it to happen now. Be manifested in this place, God. Let your glory fill the house. Let your presence fill this sanctuary. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. They are called premonitions when people sense what is about to happen. You didn't realize you'd give me a confirmation while I go for the nation. Something you're telling me. They forecast or predict future events that are going to happen. Are they... It's a hunch, a fifth sense, a knowledge of what will soon come to pass. There have been some notable premonitions in history. Abraham Lincoln dreamed of his own death and funeral. He shared this with his wife and bodyguard just hours before his assassination. The novice Mark Twain always felt that since he was born at the appearance of Halley's Comet, he would die when the comet returned, and his premonition was accurate. Morgan Robinson wrote of a huge ship called the Titan that was struck by an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank. This was written a dozen years before the Titanic ever sailed. The most startling Premonition to me is found in night. It is a partly self-biographical story of Nobel Prize winning author Eli Weasel. Eli was 15 years of age when the Jews were rounded up in the village nestled in the mountains of northern Transylvania. And Eli and his company were herded into a boxcar holding 80 Jews. I've heard my daddy preach about the boxcars going to Jablinka many of times as a kid. And they began a northwestward journey to only God knew where. For three days and nights, these 80 people stayed on the boxcar. And a woman named Madam, uh, can you really pronounce her last name, but she made the nights very uncomfortable. She had a startling vision, a premonition. Before we get to her premonition, my attention rests on the number 80. 80 souls that was on that cattle car. 
80 words that was spoken from a man in unspeakable pain. The man only speaks three times in Scripture. His words are pinned in fiery red. His three phrases contain 80 unimaginable words. Those words go like this. Luke 16 and 24. And he cried saying, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Won't you send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame that's 31 words and then then he said I pray thee therefore father that thou wouldest send him to my father's house for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also should come into this place of torment 34 words and then the 30th verse and he said nay father Abraham but if one went unto them from the dead they would repent 15 words 31 plus 34 plus 15 80 words of such terror premonitions of things that's going to happen in the night 80 words 80 fearful words if these 80 words were found in a very very grim version of a book called fairy tales that I was talking about earlier I could rest much easier but they're not found in some book called a fairy tale they're found these 80 words in the gospel in the Bible in the Word of God brother sagely if these hallelujah 80 words were found in the Old Testament Amid some gloomy prophecy about a rebellious Israel. Hallelujah. I could again sleep much easier. But they're not. They're found in the New Testament. If these 80 words were found, Sister Robbie, in the book of Revelations, intoned over some apostate antichrist system, I could rest easier. But they're not. They're found in the Gospels. They're found in the Good News. They're found in the section that we all look go to to make matters worse. They're not only found there. They're pinned in blood, red straight from the mouths of cheese. Jesus, just after, just after the lost, just after the lost and found section that's found in Luke chapter 15, a lost sheep was found, a lost coin was found, a lost son was found, but now we get to Luke chapter 16, and it shows what happens to the lost that are not found. I'm telling you, there are lost that are found, but there are lost that never get found. I've got a bad habit of losing iPads when I'm traveling. I wish I wish I could find one of them. I did find one of them. I went to Israel, had an iPad Pro, and uh, I miss it. Brother Sage was trying to get me to buy one so he can buy my other one. But I, I miss it. It had a black cover on it. And on that airplane coming back to New York, I laid, went to sleep, and laid that right there on that, uh, on that floor. And in the hustle of getting up and clearing customs, I didn't realize that I left that. And I made it through customs. And if you ever went through customs, Brother Nation, I know you know what I'm talking about. You don't go back through again <laughs> and try to get your connecting flight. I was trying everything that I could. And they said, well, you know, you can call back later. And it didn't have uh, cellular service. It was just Wi-Fi on it. And, man, I was looking and I was looking. And, uh, and I, I was somewhere that it's sitting somewhere on a lost and found. You said, somebody got it. No, they ain't got it. I, 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 they can't use it if they got it because I, I locked that thing up so good. I, but I promise you, it's sitting somewhere. It was never found. I, it, I, it may be just sitting in a basket. Somebody finally it's going to get thrown out I, and be recycled or whatever it may be. I, no use and no value to anything. I, but on the last cruise, I believe it was, that we went on, I, my, me and my wife was sitting up on one of the decks and then she had went on down I think to the room and I'm sitting there with my iPad well I decided I wanted to go get that 34 piece of pizza 
you know, 24-7 pizza, and I got to get my money's worth. And, and, and Brother Noah, you know about them, snow, them, them ice creams, right? About 60-something of them at a time. I remember that. And so I, 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 I left to go get it, and I, I'm on my way back with my pizza, with a few pieces. And I'm on my way back, and it hit me, my iPad. That black case. I left it laying by that chair, and man, I run down there, and there ain't no iPad. And man, I'm, I'm about to tear a ship apart. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I can't find nothing, I can't do And so, needless to say, I go down to, to the third deck where my wife was, and she was there. And she said, well, did you check with lost and found? I said, well, you know, customer service, I said, I just lost it. Ain't nobody turned it in by now. I mean, this, uh, but I said, you know what, I might as well just go on over and check. And when I walked over there, that man said, he said to me, he said, uh, can, he said, hold on just a second. And I told him I was looking for an iPad. He came back over there and he said, can you, can you open that I, this iPad right here? I said, can I open it? That's my grandbaby's on there. You better believe I can open that iPad. Hand me that thing. And, and they handed me that iPad. Man, I'm telling you, I went from I had lost my appetite to I got it back even more. I, I was excited. But you know what? That's the way, that's, that's a simple comparison. But when we're talking about heaven or hell, and you're never found, friend, and you're lost for eternity, I, I'm telling you, and you compare it to being found the day that God, you said, I found God. No, I didn't find God. God found me. God wasn't lost. I was the one that was lost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a place. The destiny of lost people is an unimaginable place of horror. It's a place of night unending. A couple dozen years ago, Martin Macy gave a lecture entitled Hell disappeared and no one noticed his premise was that a major christian belief had simply disappeared in a single generation look around and you'll probably agree a u.s magazine one asked its readers who they pictured in hell readers could only name two people for sure hitler and stalin Two-thirds of Americans today don't believe in hell or say, or it says so in a recent poll. According all the way back in June 19, 2002, 20 years ago, the L.A. Times article, it was in there in the mention of hell from American pulpits. They said, is that a all Time low. I, I can remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, probably the early 90s, uh, when my dad was pastoring, uh, and there was a church, and, and you said, don't call, uh, yeah, I might as well call it because it's false doctrine. Uh, there was a Presbyterian church uh, up in the, in the next town over, and they said, if you don't want to hear about hell, uh, come to our church. Uh, if you don't want to be hearing about the bad things, uh, come here. We'll talk to you about the love of God. Uh, we'll talk to you about the good things. My daddy, they put it in the newspaper. My daddy come real close. I wish she'd have done it. And started to put his own article in the newspaper to say this. If you want to hear about hell, come to our church. If you want to hear about the love of God that is preaching to you about hell, come to our church. Going to a church and asking them not to preach about hell. It's like going to the doctor and saying, tell me only what I want to hear. There have been, there's, has been a shift in religion from focusing upon what happens in the next life to asking this. What is the quality of this life we are leading now? You can go to a whole lot of churches week after week. Mr. Harvey Cox, Jr. from Harvard, Har excuse me, Harvard Divinity School said, you can go to a lot, of whole, a lot of churches week after week and be startled even if the word hell was mentioned. Hell disappeared and no one noticed. The Los Angeles Times article cited previously said the tendency to forsake 
the fire and brimstone has grown in recent years as non-denominational ministries with their focus on everyday issues such as child rearing, career sets has grown and loyalty to churches has deteriorated. Billy Graham before he died was quoted that he cannot in good conscience preach about a literal burning hell. This was the same man that one time stood in a pulpit and said if there was more hell in the pulpit there would be less hell in the pew. But now he said before he died I can't even in good conscience preach that there is a hell. A literal hell. What a change. What happened to hell? Hell's omitted. People don't want to hear about it. Consumer minded preachers ignore it. Hell's translated away. As more translations of the Bible appear, hell is mentioned less and less. Hell is not needed. I'll never forget. I'll never forget exactly one of the places in Pensacola, Florida. And Brother Adams, when you was preaching a revival, I was a, I turned 10 year old when I was there. And I can remember the big bikers coming in with their leather jackets and, uh, and the truck drivers coming in and the two whole rows there, though, there. And my daddy would take what I did. You wonder where I got that? I got it from him. My daddy would take that nail and he would stick it in those jokers' hands. And they would sit there and shake under the power of God. And they would run to an altar. But hell don't scare nobody anymore. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. It's Hollywood. That's all it is. I'm here to tell you, hell's real. Hell's hot. Hell's go. You better wake up or you'll go to hell. Here we are back. I ain't pinning any roses on me. But several a few years ago, I, when Brother Tim Joyner was preaching, pastoring, and over somewhere over in Louisiana, close to Gina, but it wasn't there. And he was preaching over there. I remember Brother Worley, Brother McDaniel, did you go with me? I remember a couple of y'all went with me. And I preached, I preached a message that I preached here many times. I stole this in from my daddy too. Hallelujah, on hell's national anthem. I did it my way. And I, see, that's the kind of things he preached when he evangelized. And, and I remember something that struck me. I was preaching a pastor's appreciation service. But he told me, thank you for preaching the way you did. Because evangelists are few and far between that will get up and preach about hell anymore. Will preach conviction anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The shortest. Some say that the, uh, you know, hell doesn't mean hell. I'm here to say the shortest step to saying goodbye to hell is to say fire does not mean fire. Hell then is dead, then refined into whatever a person wants it to be. As liberal theologians put nails in hell's coffin, more people are going there every day. The Bible said daily, hell is enlarging itself. I'm here to hell. You don't think hell's got room for you? Hell's got room for you. I drove by and I looked at the graveyards today. And I thought, man, these graveyards are pretty full in Jackson. I, you know, I wonder how many open plots that they got. And something got a hold of me. And I begin to think, you may not have room in this dirt right here, but hell always has room for you. Hell always has room for you. With each of us steers this premonition that hell is for real. Our minds may try to argue it away, but never our hearts. We know that something rotten dwells within each and every one of us. There's some sense, there's some dread, there's some forbearing feeling that judgment is coming. And that hell can't be far behind that judgment. But for the shed blood of Calvary, but for his blood, we feel that we would, if it was not for Calvary, we would share in that night unending. It's just too negative. Bruce Shelley, professor at Denver Theological Seminary, said, It's just too negative. Churches are under enormous pressure to be consumer-oriented. Churches today feel the need to be appealing rather than demanding. If preaching about hell is too negative, then not preaching is a false positive. 
Jeremiah asked us in Jeremiah 6 and 14 how we can say peace, peace when there is no peace. Jonathan Edwards said this doctrine is indeed awful and dreadful, yet this of God. Hell may have disappeared in the eye of the leaf. Hell may have disappeared in the consumer-driven churches. But some people know that hell is for real. Some know the reality of hell. What do I mean when I mention the word hell? In the King James Version of the Bible, thank you for the season. Four words. Shello, Jehene, Hades, and Tatarus are translated as hell. Each can have different in meaning. When I say hell tonight, I speak of the sum total of the afterlife for all those that are lost. For the Bible says that death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire or Gehenna. So I bypass the lobby of the wicked grave. And I enter into the full orb eternity of the lost. If heaven is the realm of the un, under, under, if hell, excuse me, heaven is the, the, the reward and the realm of the unserved rewards. Hell is the realm of the deserved punishment. And you're either going to one or you're going to the other. I preached last Wednesday. There is no middle road. In our text, it grieves me to see people. That you're trying to pull them out of almost like they're swimming and they're drowning. And you're trying to save them. And they're fighting you back harder. Remember the sage was texting this week. And we were sitting there talking about an individual that we were checking up on. That individual... Don't take two and two, put it together. Stood right here last Wednesday night and spoke in tongues for 30 minutes. You're not going to tell me that it wasn't real. Because I know what I felt. And as it grieved my heart, I think it was Monday, Tuesday, Monday, I believe it was, that I said, I sure miss you at church Sunday. I was out of town. They got back late. I said, I sure hope to see you there Wednesday. I don't know. Maybe. And so my response, I'm sorry people think I'm blunt, but we're running out of time. I'm tired of sugarcoating stuff. We're running out of time. And I fled out and said, you cannot deny what you felt. You, you question whether or not, hallelujah, that God would, would, had gave up on you or not, and he proved. But I'm here to tell you, we got too many people wondering if God gave up on them. God's asking, have you given up on him? It's not whether he gave up on you. Have you given up on him? And I told her, this individual, I said, I'm praying for you. But it's just like I said Wednesday night. There is no middle road. It's either heaven or it's hell. But there's no middle road. Brother Mills, you don't offend somebody. I'd rather offend them here than offend them over there. Hallelujah. Ain't no be no blood on this preacher's hands. And, and I, Brother Sager, you know what I was going through. I was texting with him. And Brother Sager was like, they got to have the want to. Okay. You know, and he was trying to encourage me. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me after I was over there. And he said, Chad Mills, I never called you to save anybody. I called you to preach the word, and that's it. What they do with it is up to them. But just preach it. Cry loud and spare not. But you're not. You're going to give an account for what you preach. Not for what they do <laughs> hallelujah in our text a rich man discovered the reality of hell he had it good in his lifetime in our day and time he would have, he would have had the four car garage and if you got one god bless you i wish i had one too <laughs> hallelujah nothing wrong with that he he was he had a four car garage and he was still building on to the house 
And outside of his gate sat a beggar named Lazarus. The poor man did not have it so good. Death, though, is the greatest leveler of the playing field. And the tables are now turned. Lazarus is carried to Abraham's bosom. A place of rest for the righteous dead. The rich man is dispatched to hell. In hell, the rich man spoke 80 words. His words revealed so much. First, he is trapped in a terrible place. I sometimes cringe at funerals when I hear people say, like, at least he, at least she's in a better place. How do I know that? If the dad could speak, I would hope they would say something like, I'm in a better place. But how frightened it would be to hear them scream, Somebody help me! Please, I'm being tormented. I'm in agony. Play games with anything you like, but not with eternity. So first, this man was trapped in a terrible place. Second, I hear a man cry for mercy. In life, he did not show mercy. But now he desires son. In life, he didn't have time for Lazarus. But now he's requesting Lazarus. He's not requesting the governor. He's not requesting the president. He's not requesting anybody at all. He's not requesting a friend from the country club. He's requesting one thing. Would you send Lazarus? Would you send that beggar? Would you send the one that was trying to? I'm here to tell you right now. If you up in, end up in hell, you don't miss this preacher. You don't request that this preacher will come and give you one more altar call and preach to you. Hallelujah. You that think uh, Sunday I was rebuking you. Uh, you that felt like I was whooping up on you for telling you to pray. You will beg me to preach one more time. You will plead for me to preach one more time. My dad preached a message and I'll never forget things going on in hell that should be going on in the church. There's a lot of praying going on in hell tonight. There's a lot of weeping going on in hell tonight. There's a lot of people that wants to listen to preaching. In fact, I'm here to tell you right now that hell, the fire is not going to be the, the hardest thing on you in hell. <laughs> Hallelujah. The gnashing of teeth is not going to be the hardest thing on you in hell, friend, if you end up in hell. It's not going to be the demons. <laughs> What's going to be the worst thing in hell is <laughs> you don't have a memory. <laughs> you don't remember every altar call. <laughs> you don't remember every time you heard a soul say and you felt conviction. <laughs> you don't remember every opportunity and invitation that you have, but it's it's too late. Hallelujah, it's too late. And the second thing, it's going to be worse about hell. The second worst thing about hell is this. Everything that you can't give up now, you're going to give them up to go to hell. You're going to give them up to go to hell. You may not can give them up to go to heaven, but you don't give them up to go to hell. And here's the problem, friend. Here's the problem. You, you got a problem with pornography? You don't have the same problem when you get to hell, but you're not going to be able to fulfill the lust of your flesh then. You got to have the craving for alcohol in hell, but you're not going to be able to fulfill it. You don't have the craving for nicotine in hell, but you're not going to be able to fulfill it. You don't have the craving for the lust of your flesh in hell, but you're, it's going to be that craving, but you can't feel it. Mercy. Mercy. Father Abraham, mercy. All Lazarus had desire in life with a few crumbs from the rich man's table. Now all the rich man desires is a drop of water from Lazarus' finger. He's parched. He's tormented. According to the scripture, hell in Luke 12 and 4 through 5 is to be feared. And Matthew 5 and 29 through 30 is to be aborted at all costs. And Matthew 13 and 42, it is a fiery furnace. In Revelation 20 and 10, it's a lake of burning sulfur. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and 9, it's everlasting. In Matthew 2 and 12, it is unquenchable. In Jude 1 and 7, it is eternal. In Matthew 8 and 12, it is filled with suffering. It's somebody tells you hell ain't real if somebody tells you hell ain't literal they're lying to you hell's real Matthew 26 and 24 the son of man goeth as it is written of him but woe unto him woe unto that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it had been good for that man if he had not been born 
I'm just going to be honest with you. It would have been better if you was a sinner and never knew Never knew this plan of salvation. Never speak in tongues. Never repent of your sin. Never been baptized in his name. Then to go through all of that and walk out on this guy. Matthew 5 and 29. If thy right eye offends you, plug it out. You said it. You, if, cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish. And not that the whole body be cast into hell. In other words, whatever it takes, i got to be saved. Some may say, I cannot believe that a loving God would do such a thing uh, to a person. Uh, would you believe Jesus in? Because uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, uh, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's only one that can do that. Understand, God don't send nobody to hell. If you go there, you go as an intruder and you send yourself to hell. Hallelujah. Robert Agersall, a famous lawyer and an atheist, in the latter part of the 19th century, once delivered a blistering lecture on hell. He called hell the scarecrow of religion. He told his audience, how unscientific it was and how all intelligent people had decided that there was no such place. A drunk in the audience came up to him afterwards and said, Bob, I liked your lecture. I liked what you had to say about hell. But Bob, I want you to be sure about it because I'm depending on you. I want to make sure, Bob, you know what you're talking about. You better find a preacher that knows what he's talking about when it comes to hell. What if you're wrong, Brother Mills? And I can get to heaven and I didn't have to do nothing but just accept him and and live whatever life. uh, Then we're all going to be happy. But what if I'm right and you're wrong? We got a problem somewhere. Why do I preach this way as a pastor? Because people are depending on me. I have to tell them the truth. On this side of death, the lost can attain 10,000 gallons of mercy. But on the other side, Sister Margie, the lost cannot get one single drop of mercy. One drop. Just one drop. Send Lazarus. Send the person I despised on earth. Send the person I like the least. Send the one I ignored. No, said Abraham. It's not possible. There's a great gulf in life. You are separated by a single gate of prejudice, of pride, of unconcern. But in eternity, there's a great gulf. Finally, the rich man's words revealed that he cared too late. He called for someone to go to his five brethren, his five brothers. He didn't want anyone to come to that place. I hear people say, I'm going to hell because all my friends are going to be there and we're going to have one big party. In one sense, these people are correct. Isaiah 14 and 9 says, hell from beneath is excited about you. If you read it in the New King James Version, hell from beneath is excited about you. To meet you at your coming. It steers up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth. I'm here to tell you that hell has a welcome committee. The doomed and the damned align themselves to to greet the new arrivals. Misery loves company. Eternal misery loves lots of company. So hell keeps getting bigger and bigger. Isaiah 5 and 14, I quoted it earlier. Therefore hell have enlarged herself and opened up her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiced it shall descend into it stop preacher I'll stop soon because we're running out of time preacher I could listen to an hour preaching about prosperity but two minutes on hell is way too long stop preacher lighten up Billy Sunday once told this he said He was once told this by somebody. He said, Brother Sunday, you need to lighten up. Your preaching rubs the cat the wrong way. To which Mr. Sunday replied, then let the cat turn around. Because the way he's facing now, he's on his way to hell. I'll lighten up when you brighten up. 
I'll chill when your future, sir, ma'am, looks brighter. I'll be silent when you turn from eternal darkness to eternal light. Hell's an unusual place. It's a place of fire. But it is also what I'm preaching about tonight. It is a place of unending night. Hell is night unending. Black fire. Explain that, preacher. Hell hails from a word that means hole or hollow. Hell is called a pit, the abyss, the deep. Three times in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus speaks of the wonderful day when believers enter into the joys of heaven, the land of unending light. Jesus also said that the unbelievers will be cast into outer darkness, the pit of unending night. Jude said uh, that the blackness in Jude 13, 1 and 13, that the blackness of the darkness forever is reserved for those who turn their backs on God. And in the same breath, Jude called them wandering stars. Lucifer is described decri- as the rude star, attempting to ascend above the other stars, Isaiah 14 and 13. And pulled it and demoted his life, Lucifer's life become darkened by his pride. An astronomy professor was asked about wandering stars that the Bible talks about. His conclusion was that the wandering stars could be one of several things. Comets, planets, or black holes. Throughout the cosmos there are black holes from which not even light escapes itself. Unique combinations of fire and night. Outer darkness exists now in the universe, he said, so Hell is not a far-fetched ideal. Occupants of hell are enemies of God. They deny his goodness in their earthly existence. So he denies his goodness in their eternal existence. Premonitions. Premonitions of fire and night. Eighty words of unspeakable terror. Eighty souls on that boxcar. Come to the music. Referring back to the box card that I started off the message with. Healy Weasel described the trip the first night on that car. Doors were nailed shut. The lady madam, she, a quiet woman that was respected by her village, was one of those 80 souls. She and her 10-year-old son crouched over in a corner. Elder Sister Mills, on that that first night, she moaned. But on that third night, Sister Courtney, she began to scream. Fire, she shouted. Fire. I can see a fire. I can see a fire. Weasel said that she looked like a withering tree in the cornfield. And Madam began to point out that window. Look, look at it, fire, a terrible fire, mercy, mercy, oh, that fire, play just a little softer, so convincing, was she that a few people actually will begin to glance outside and look out the windows only to see darkness, somehow, Someone said she's gone mad. Others tried to calm her, but she just kept on screaming. Her son was crying. He begged his mother to calm down and the rest, but she kept screaming a fire. She burst into tears and she began sobbing. Jews, listen to me. I can see a fire. I can see huge flames. It's a furnace. Weasel said it was though she had been, Madam had been possessed by an evil spirit speaking from the core of her being. Everyone on board began to rationalize it away. She must be a very thirsty poor soul losing her mind. That's why she keeps talking about a fire. Through the night she would scream. Grow quiet. Scream again. People's nerves were on edge. They struck her to make her grow quiet. 
but still she cried about fire. They grew weary of trying to make her be silent. And then the train finally slowed down and she screamed one last time, Jews, look! Look through the windows, flames, look. In the night sky, they looked out. In the elder mills, they saw flames gushing from a tall spokestack in the sky. She grew quiet. The train stopped. Doors were open. Shouts came to exit the car. Eighty souls stepped out into the flames. She had experienced a premonition of a long night. Weasel got off the boxcar, and for a moment, he caught a glimpse of his mother and sister march one way with a promise of a fresh shower and a change of clothes. Instead, it was not that. They were leered into the gas chamber to be killed and then to be burned. Eli and his father were taken another way. They stood in a line thinking it was they who were to be thrown into the fire pit. He said this in his book, Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, which had turned my life into one lone night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turn into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consume my faith forever. Never shall I forget that silence which deprived me for all of eternity of the desires to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself never. Those that went to the right went into the flames. Those that went to the left were spared. Weasel was spared. Others were not. Not me, preacher. Not me. Not me. Call me crazy if you like. Pity me. Get angry at this preacher. Mock me. But I'm here to tell you I got a premonition tonight and I see flames. I got a premonition of a night that's unending. Which line do you stand in? In Matthew 25 and 31 through 34, Jesus said there's going to be two lines. There's going to be four. He compares the group to obedient sheep and disobedient goat. And which one will it be? Don't misjudge God's patience and kindness. It's there to lead you to repentance. Which line will you stand in? Which line will you stand in? Because you're old enough to either go to heaven or hell. Which line will you stand in? Won't have time to pray. Won't have time to get in. I'm not saying they got anything wrong. I'm preaching to all of us. Won't have time. Won't have time to get a prayer line. Won't have time to learn how to pray. Which line, Brother Gardner, will you stand in? As the tree falls, so shall it lie. It's strand. For the nations, that's the day that it happens. Sister Angela, we won't be able to pray for anybody else. Which line? We which line? Brother Smith. I, 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 only you know only you and God know but I believe that'll be the day that you say it was worth it all every trial every test every time I came by this church when I didn't feel like it and I prayed and I prayed and I talked to God I'm here to tell you I got Jackson which line you don't stand in son is it going to be heaven is it going to be hell Carly which line you don't stand in Chris what line you don't stand in Tony what line you don't stand in Allie Noah what you can't give up now, son. You give it up to go to hell. You give it up to go to hell. You come out of the fall of all my son. I'm preaching with a burden. Hallelujah. I'm crying loud. It's a fair night. You gotta be saved. You gotta be saved. Hank. You won't be able to stay if I don't have one foot in or one foot out. It's either both feet in heaven or both feet in hell. Which line you don't be in? Which line? Romans 2 and 4 are despised as all the riches of his good and of forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. 
God suffers long, but time is running out. Can you sense that? Perhaps you too have a premonition of a night and then. Grace can teach your heart to fear. Grace can then relieve your fears. These altars are open. These altars are open. Which line are you in? Which line are you in? Which line are you in? I see flames. I see flames. I see flames. We're running out of time. This world's going to hell in a handbasket. I said this world's going to hell in a handbasket. But I'm here to tell you, we're running out of time. We don't have time to play. We don't have time to, to, to get things right. We don't have to. You better throw yourself at the mercy of God. It ain't a time for you to get things right. If you could have got things right, you would have got it right a long time ago. But you can't do it. You can't do it. But God can do it. Hallelujah. Brownie. I know you got a career plan to have you, and I'm proud of you. I want you to do that. But you better make sure what line you're in, son. You better make sure what line you're in. Say something. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Are you praying? Are you praying? These altars are open. I've got to be saved. 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 I gotta 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 be saved. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I gotta be saved. I gotta be saved. I gotta make it. I gotta make it. Come on, church. Here's another person that's name wrote on this altar right here, on this platform. And God's doing it. God's doing it. It, it just hit me. Hold on just a minute. It just hit me what I just told her. My God, it just hit me. Y'all heard some of you heard me last Sunday say it. That Sister Tori texted me last Thursday and told me that Taylor had contacted her and wanted to come to church. But that morning, I got the text message to prove it. That morning, on Thursday morning, I woke up, Brother Sagely. I told you about it. And I raised up in the bed, and before I ever rode out of the bed, Taylor's name come to me, and her face come before me. God gave me a premonition that she was going to be in this place tonight. And immediately, that Thursday afternoon, God gave me that message. He called her by Sunday. But I'm excited, Taylor. You're not going to hell. We're going to rescue you out of hell. To go to heaven in this place. Say.
I'm telling you what I feel in the, what I felt ever since last Thursday. This is going to be one of the final strolls that brings Billy Baggett into this church right here. I'm telling you right now, in the Holy Ghost, the family's going to be complete before it's over with. Come on, why don't you link up with somebody and begin to pray? God's going to renew her in the Holy Ghost here in a few minutes. I'm giving her time to repent. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Go ahead, go ahead. God was going to renew you. <laughs>
For some of you that don't know, this is one of David Ruff's children, if I ain't mistaken. If mom and dad don't want it, if preachers don't save their, save their children, <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes. Go ahead, baby. Holy Ghost is all over. Holy Ghost is all over. Receive it right now in Jesus' name. This baby wants the Holy Ghost. For the Hoyt and them brought her in the 10 minute trip here, the whole time they talked about what age Aubrey and Ava was when they got the Holy Ghost. Cause she wants the Holy Ghost. Uh, hallelujah. Come on, I want her to go home full of it. I want her to go home and mom and dad say, what's happened to you? I got the Holy Ghost, daddy. I got the Holy Ghost, mama.
Elder Mills talked to me about something the other day, and it really has been on my mind. I talked to my wife about it. He's mentioned it a couple times since then, since the burden that God put on him. And he's talked about how God, if you've been missing Elder Mills, he's been preaching out a lot. He's, uh, he's in revival uh, down at Sulphur so every, on the weekends. But he made mention about what the Bible talks about. God leaves the 99 and go gets the one. And he said he felt such a burden is let's focus on the one. Let's focus on the one. And I remember something one of my elders always, I would always hear him say when I was be at Revival is, how we don't win this city, one soul at a time. Like that. How you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Okay. So one of the things, we're going to roll out something a little bit more formal where we don't, we don't have some structure. Where we're going we're to have either one person slash one family every week going forward. And we'll have it ready by this Sunday and everything. But here's who we're going to focus on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. Billy Baggett. That means every day you're going to pray for Billy Baggett. Every day we're going to reach, touch heaven for Billy Baggett. If you feel like fasting for somebody, fast for Billy Baggett. And I promise you, he's going to get to a place that he's going to have to come. And he's going to get to a place that he's going to have to hit the altar. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm telling you, I, 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 so we're going to, how many will help us focus on Billy Baggett between now and Sunday? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm telling you, Brother Hoyt, this little girl is so close. It wouldn't surprise me if one of these prayer meetings were getting together and coming and uh, praying. She don't just bring her with you. She's liable to get it right there. Them, them girls of yours liable to pray her through. Hallelujah. Let them pray church, whatever. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Y'all can make your way back to your seats. Hallelujah. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody's still in travail. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to say thanks to those that came out to the ladies' prayer meeting. Um, they said, good turnout and a good prayer meeting. Appreciate that. Those that came out to community Bible study, man, brother, nation's done an outstanding job, as always, but very good. I, I, was, I, I know I enjoyed it, and I know everybody else did, but we came up here after church, and uh, I mean, after Bible study, and like I said, there were 17, 18 people in here praying already, talking to God. People kept coming in. We had a good move, and and uh, then there was people all throughout the day. Sister Amy is paying off, ain't it? Hallelujah. She's like clockwork. A little after 7 o'clock, she's going to be coming in here. And uh, and so I beat you here this morning, though. Hallelujah. And But it was a, um, I appreciate those who have been coming throughout the day. There's or some of our seniors come, just different ones. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, this Friday night, ATL of Kids Skating Out and see Sister Tara Martin, uh, our brother Tony Martin, for more information on that. There's a youth event this Saturday, uh, and uh, they'll be going to the rodeo in Clinton. So see Sister Tracy, our brother Jeff, if you need their Sister Tracy's sick tonight, so that and uh, they had she's at urgent care. So remember her in prayer. But that'll be they'll be communicating that this Sunday. MIT preachers. Our young preachers at uh, 10 a.m. We got excited. I'm looking forward to what we we got planned, and so let, let you do your homework. I'll do my homework, and we'll have a good time. But we'll be meeting in Elder Mills' class, Elder Sister Mills' classroom at 10 a.m. Thank again. Thank for those who have been signing the prayer log. We appreciate that very much. Would you please remember it, it also this week, my nanny, uh, Elder Sister Uzzle, um, the Basically, she fits to be turned over to hospice. And so uh, it, it, she's taking a very turn for the worse. I found this out right before church. And uh, she's, um, it, it seemed to really be, uh, she took a trip to Branson last week, uh, actually. And I told Brother Nations, I said, I guess I should have prophesied God was going to give her a miracle because I prophesied she was going to Branson. And she did. And, but God knows. He's in his, I don't want to see her suffer, 
Only he knows if he's going to do the miracle or not, if he desires to do the miracle or not. But please pray for that, uh, that God's will will be done in that situation. And uh, so help us pray on that. Uh, just to kind of update you on the, I know I said a couple weeks ago we bought a new church van. I was actually supposed to be catching the Amtrak tomorrow to go get to Tennessee to get that and drive it back. And Amtrak's going on strike at midnight tomorrow night. So my, my ticket got canceled. And so I had to wait until they get off strike or unless I end up uh, going up there a different route. So, but uh, they're holding it for us. So uh, we'll have a new van, another van here for a loan. But thank you so much. Sister Mills. Well, you don't need to go. Pray for them. Pray for me. Sister Stage, I'm out of a shrimp and corn soup. Uh, so if you want to fix <laughs> if you want to fix another thing. Sister Angela, I'm out of dumplings. I ain't had none in quite a while. Uh, right, no, nah, I'm just cutting up. Hallelujah. Let, let's pray over this prayer cloth for them. Hallelujah. And, and I'll tell you, Sister Mills, and, and kind of cutting up, when you get on there, it's kind of like the Elder Mills said in the prayer meeting here a while back if you find Jonah, one of y'all Jonah throw him overboard hallelujah God right now I pray for the protective hand of God on them as they're on this cruise God watch over and protect them keep them safe from harm give them peace put angels and count about them in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen you're dismissed in Jesus name shake hands and be friends hallelujah see I was going to teach on tithing and offerings again for the second week but I preached again so hallelujah yeah thank y'all that desire to give. Hallelujah. Here you go.